As you can see here, it was 1947 when the U.S. Air Force was first formed. Maybe a little bit of a surprise, right? It was after World War II, which of course ended in 1945. But that's when it happened. That's when it was official. So the U.S. had this new branch of the military, and of course it had unique needs. If you're an infantryman in the army, you can run around with, uh, you know, 40, 70 pounds of equipment, whatever they saddle you with. Uh, but if you're a pilot, that's a different story. Weight really, really matters. So this was a brand new age, right? We're sending pilots up in the sky, all kinds of new airplanes, new missions. And they do their fighting with their plane. But what kind of a sidearm do you give them? Well, a small one, because small equals light, but... Even that's not enough, so we're going to look at an incredibly rare revolver today. I'm really fortunate to have gotten to handle it. It's made by Colt, and when they and Smith & Wesson were making this kind of a thing, uh, small wasn't light enough, so they had to go with kind of a revolutionary design, really. And this meant using a lot of alloy, so not steel, because steel is heavy. Um, now, the lighter alloy-based revolver was nothing new, looking here at my uh, vintage Colt Cobra. And it was an updated, lighter version of the classic 1927 invented detective special, Colt's famous two-inch uh, snub-nose revolver, the first mass-produced snub-nose revolver in history. And they made it lighter by having the frame be alloy, aluminum. Now the cylinder and the barrel were still steel. But if you're working in this capacity here, that's still not good enough. So the Air Crewman revolver was invented. Alloy was used for the cylinder, if you can believe it, right? Like where the explosion takes place. So the Air Crewman was a modified Colt Cobra, uh, the Colt Cobra being a modified detective special. Anyway, if you were flying in the Air Force in the early 1950s, you might have one of these on you then. This is not the one I got to look at. We'll see that one coming up. But yeah, a handsome gun, little six-shooter, but one that only weighed about 11 ounces loaded, and that is very light, as some of you might know, for a handgun. Now, while we look at a couple of more uh, airmen strapped with uh, six shooters, how wonderfully anachronistic is that? I mean, we're talking about the atomic age here. Anyway, while we roll through those, the thing was, uh, you know, with a alloy cylinder, you had to use special ammunition, so they couldn't use normal 38 special ammunition. You needed something with a lighter load. A weaker explosion, basically, right? So it doesn't overly stress that metal, which is not good old-fashioned steel. Steel was, by the way, used in the barrel. And we haven't touched on the intended use here of these things. You're not going to shoot somebody with your uh, little snub nose from up in the air. This was a survival pistol, right? You crash land in enemy territory, at least you've got something. So, pretty awesome. You can see here how the handle was stamped and it was really important to have these clearly marked right because you did not want to confuse these with a regular 38 special still not the one i got to hold uh, either of these pictures but these are great pictures of uh, similar models uh, and there's only so many of these out there that's the thing by some estimates there's only 50 of the colts in existence you can see then why i was really excited to get to actually handle one and see it in person here's a factory letter for one shipped out in 1951 Sold to United States government. Uh, I like that. Accurate as well. But they did not make these for long. Neither did Smith & Wesson. Uh, both of them stopped at 1959 as the government realized this design was not a good idea. Why wasn't it a good idea? Well, because of this. It was a little too easy to use the wrong kind of ammunition, you know, regular ammunition. And when you did that, the gun did not perform well, as you can see. That's putting it mildly little too dangerous. I mean, think about the risk-reward factor here, right? I mean, this is so you can have a two-inch snub-nose revolver with you if you land in enemy territory. And that's why there's so few of these. Estimated 50 to, say, 75 of the Colts. Not that many more remaining of the Smith & Wessons, which, by the way, were known as M13s. And the reason there's so few of either is that the government didn't just stop issuing these they didn't just stop ordering them, they ordered the destruction of the inventory. And that is why both manufacturers' versions are highly, highly collectible. So, finally, here's the one I got to see, right? 
no mistaking it. There's the name stamped right into the barrel. Uh, not that there aren't fakes of these, because there are. That was one of the interesting parts of the research I did. Uh, you know, if you've watched my other videos, the antiques world is, is filled with fakes, antique weapons as well. And these are so desirable that more than once people have constructed forgeries using various parts, maybe some parts from a real one, you know, that kind of a thing. That, pretty amazing. It's a lot of trouble to go through, but then again, one of these can sell for tens of thousands of dollars. You can see here that the one I examined was definitely a six-shot revolver. My understanding is that that's the only kind of Colt made. Smith & Wesson, however, made a six and a five-shot. Overall, this thing presents an interesting history of a design failure. Like, the idea was not bad, right? If they could have pulled this off, found a way to have a, a normal-sized but snub-nosed revolver uh, that was extra, extra light and yet safe, then they probably could have sold a lot of them, and not just to the military. I mean, you think of today's air weight snub those revolvers and that's the deal right they're like feather light but look how long it took modern technology to make that kind of thing safe so pretty cool here you can see the uh air force bag going back to the intention here of the weapon you know the desperation sidearm your plane has been downed at least you've got something on you uh what turned out to be the case was pilots realized it was much more useful as a signal device than as a weapon so they would carry tracer ammo with it so if you got downed it was a great tool to help your fellow uh pilots and maybe a rescue crew find you and that makes a lot of sense because when traveling light is a big requirement then a multi-use tool has an increased value certainly now, going back to Colt versus Smith & Wesson, uh, it, Colt actually lost the big contract, so they made far, far less of these. I think less than 1,500. Meanwhile, Smith & Wesson made, I think, 40,000. Since they ended up being the big supplier to the U.S. Air Force for this kind of a thing, uh, and either way, there are very few examples of either manufacturer's work. So anyone who's got their hands on either example is pretty lucky. And as mentioned, people do try to create fakes. I wonder if any of the actual ammunition is still floating around. Here's a piece of old documentation on the Smith & Wesson M13. Back to the Colt Air Crewman I was holding. There is the insignia that would let even a casual observer know, Hmm, this is a, not a typical civilian handgun. You can see the Colt of Colt uh, to the left of that upper left, and the handgun looks great. Look at the finish on the metal. Obviously, it didn't see a lot of use. I mean, once they were retired, somebody saved this one. Would love to know, you know, how or why. Clearly, more than a few people said, well, I don't want to really destroy this. It's worth uh, keeping, even if I'm not going to actually use it. CMC, Colts Manufacturing Company, right there on that iconic snubby barrel. Same insignia you got to see on the other side. Plus just more of it from this vantage. And finally me getting to actually hold it. You know, in the firing position, I guess. And as you can imagine, it did feel oddly light in the hand. Uh, this was obviously an unloaded one I was holding, but just, yeah, it's almost didn't feel real in your hand. Like it was more of a, I don't know, a movie prop or something. But nope, this is the real deal. Here's the back of the handle on this one, showed you the same view earlier in the video on one of the other few existing examples of this weapon. I'd like to go back to the history now. You know, obviously this is tied to the Air Force. Kind of the godfather of the Air Force was General Curtis LeMay, pictured here, and he was a big deal. He's one of those people who greatly influences a nation's history, but does not become a household name. Uh, I only know that because Malcolm Gladwell did like a three-part, at least, uh, episode of podcast about him. And I was surprised to find out, I read a lot of articles about, uh, you know, the Colt Air Crewman and the Smith & Wesson M13. It wasn't until late that I finally realized, uh, I finally found a source that said he personally requested the development of this type of revolver. So that is definitely an interesting little footnote. And then on top of that, what he had in mind was this was specifically for bomber crews. Again, I talked about the Atomic Age. So this is the Atomic Age, and he's thinking about bomber crews that would need to fly to the Soviet Union to drop nukes in the case of a, right, all-out war. And the request for an especially light, practically all-alloy revolver was regarding the weight for a crewman who was ejecting Every ounce of weight being really, really important in that scenario. 
Other articles only stress the importance of keeping everything as light as possible on the bombers. So either way, what seems to be clear is that this temporary innovation was about bombers, like the one being climbed into here by this pilot who has, yes, a Colt Air Crewman on his hip. I used that picture before, but uh, it was handy to bring it back here for that purpose. Now, it's pretty imprecise, the record. I don't know that that means only bomber crews held these kinds, you know, the, uh, the air crewman and the M13. But anyway, there you go. And here you go with one final view of an extremely rare firearm. There's that Air Force insignia, and it will see us off. Hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about this. Thanks.